Hello, my name is Mark Lockney, and I'd like to welcome you to my video, which is entitled, of course, Wanna Talk Fantastic Literature? Accessing Fairy. And I have a quote here that I think kind of sets the tone from Spencer's The Fairy Queen in 1596. Where is that happy land of fairy which I so much do vaunt, yet nowhere show, but vouch antiquities which nobody can know? What I wanted to do here today is talk about some of the ways that fantasy authors, and science fiction authors for that matter, have created other world realms, and specifically to create a taxonomy of these realms and how people are able to access them. This was kind of prompted by a discussion in my modern fantasy class at Signum University recently, and I thought this would be a fun exercise in terms of uh, brainstorming and that kind of thing. It's intended to be lighthearted and fun rather than properly academic. So as a disclaimer, I'm basically making this taxonomy up. It feels right to me, but it may be entirely in my imagination that this makes any sense whatsoever. For the purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to use the term fairy as kind of a shorthand for any fantastic environment, you know, a sword and sorcery realm or some place where psychic powers work or something like that. Fairy could come from science fiction, fantasy, magical realism. The idea here is that it's something that's quite distinct from the primary world that we live in, we know and we understand. So think Underworld or Asgard or, you know, Middle Earth or Fairy or something like that. Don't be thinking about Mars or Tibet or something that's more obviously within our realm of reality. My agenda here today is to talk a little bit about fantastic realms, specifically within Western history, since that's what I know best. Talk about conceptions of fairy by some great thinkers, such as J.R.R. Tolkien. And then go through our taxonomy of different kinds of fairy based on how they're accessed. I'm going to be looking at how you get there and how you get back, how it differs from the real world or the primary world, where fairy is physically located, how fairy is explained, and then try and demonstrate it with some specific works of literature that use this approach, and then look at what it might mean to us as readers, all the while having fun doing it. I will have slides available at the URL below if you want to get something that's clickable. Now I should point out that a taxonomy like this doesn't always work because authors are creative and there's often stories that partially or wholly fit into multiple categories, or sometimes none. However, a taxonomy does at least give you a good starting point to agree or disagree, and in that respect, it's at least useful. I'd love to have any comments, criticisms, or suggestions for new categories or works that could be inserted into this framework. I mentioned that this was a thought exercise that came out of my Signum class, and in this class we had several works that were assigned, including The Last Unicorn, A Wizard of Earthsea, Stardust, Summer Night, Sabriel, and A Game of Thrones. I wanted to take those books, fit them into some category, and then juxtapose them with some other classics, older ones such as Sir Orfeo or Le Morte de Arthur, modern classics such as The Lord of the Rings or Lewis's Narnia books, and possibly some future classics, or at least what I think will be future classics, such as Andrei Sapkowski's The Witcher or Charles Strauss's Laundry Files. The first thing we need to do with an experiment like this is identify primary and secondary worlds and what that really means. So the primary world is the world we live in. It's the world of reality. It's a place that has Europe and America and all of these other things which we know and recognize. In other words, it's explicitly the real world within the story. And of course, there are a lot of primary-like worlds that take advantage of features of reality, especially historical ones such as feudalism or uh, kingship and things like that. But unless the author tells you explicitly that this is Earth, it's probably safe to think of this as a secondary world. And by secondary world, we mean a completely created dimension, some other place, some other universe, some other planet, some environment that is wholly fictitious, but yet still has its own rules to it. This is kind of the typical setting of high fantasy. So Middle Earth is a good example of this, or Narnia. It's also possible, optionally, to have what you might call a tertiary world. So you could have a world that is accessible only within a secondary world. So maybe there is a special dimension that you can go to within your secondary world, or possibly there is an extra island that you can get to, which is extra super magical like Valinor in Tolkien's work. Another option for a tertiary work is that it could be based on another secondary work, like many fantasy stories are since The Lord of the Rings, based on Tolkien's conception of what a fantasy story should be. They kind of took off with that idea, modified it a little bit, and a lot of writing since Tolkien has been figuring out ways to differentiate yourself from Tolkien and still come up with a good fantasy story that people want to buy and read. Tolkien wrote the seminal essay on this topic entitled On Fairy Stories in 1939, and he defines a fairy story not as something that is about fairies, 
but one that touches on the realm of fairy. So its purpose might be satire, adventure, morality, or fantasy, he says, but it's definitely not about little Tinkerbell fairies like you would find from the Victorian era, nor are fairy stories Tolkien maintains just for children. A good fairy story will produce what Tolkien called secondary belief, that kind of suspension of disbelief we have when we engage with fiction. We can really kind of believe in this fairy realm, this fairy tale, because it makes sense. And one thing that Tolkien is very clear on is that of all the things that you might make fun of using a fairy story for satire, for example, if there is one thing you cannot make fun of, it is the magic. So the world has to have its own rules and be internally consistent. The fairy that Tolkien envisions, quote, cannot be caught in a net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. So it's kind of ineffable. It's got that certain flavor to it. Maybe you can't call it out, maybe you can't define it ahead of time, but you know it when you see it. And when you're creating a secondary world, Tolkien maintains, you are, in a sense, becoming a sub-creator. You're kind of taking on the powers of a god in your literature by creating this realm. And if people inhabit this realm, if they spend time thinking about it, as so many people have in playing a Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game, for example, or a really good fantasy video game, then is that not, in a sense, real? Presumably, Tolkien also meant this to apply to women as well as men. I'm hoping that he was just using shorthand for mankind. There are actually a lot of fictional works where there are multiple secondary worlds. So if you take as an example C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, we have the book The Magician's Nephew from 1955, where Diggory and Polly find a, quote, wood between the worlds. And in this woods, there are multiple pools of water, each of which lead to a different dimension. As another example in the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game, there are any number of different planes ranging from planes of elemental fire to different versions of hell where there are demons and devils to the astral plane and all kinds of things in between. Many stories also use the typical heaven and hell environments as seen in this picture from Paradise Lost by Milton. And a lot of works, both mythological and modern fiction, also embrace realms like Asgard, which is the home of the Norse gods, as seen from this Marvel Cinematic Universe picture. The Norse universe also has Elfheim, which is the home of elves, both light and dark, which were documented by Snorri Sturluson in the Prose Edda. So if you really want to know where elves came from, Elfheim is a good possibility. As a final example of a secondary world, I'm going to show you the I Hate Fairyland comic series by Scotty Young. This series details the adventures of a destructive and foul-mouthed little girl named Gertrude, who unwillingly becomes lost in fairyland. She's sick and tired of fairy, she doesn't age after years of trying to find a way out, and she isn't happy about it. So, she murders just about every fluffy bunny, magical creature, and fairy princess she can lay her hands on until she finds a way to get home. It's really quite good, and gives us a good example of fairyland turned on its head. So where did all these fairy tales and folklorist stories come from? Truthfully, nobody really knows, and scholars have been debating this for centuries. There's a lot of possibilities, though. Perhaps they're fragmented memories of real cultures or people that have been lost or displaced. Perhaps they are really about mythological realms and characters that have been demoted to fiction because monotheism, particularly Christianity, has made those stories no longer believable or true. Or perhaps they're just simply fantastic settings for cautionary tales on morality and social norms. Certainly one thing we learn from fairy tales is that things don't turn out well when you fall in love with a fairy princess. Perhaps these stories started out as primitive explanations for the unknown, like illness or lightning, kind of how people think that primitive animistic religions began. Or perhaps they are all really about the normally hidden elements of human psychology playing themselves out in fiction. It could be that some of these stories are about real-life heroes, such as King Arthur, that have become more and more fictionalized over time. It could be all or none of these. One thing that's important to remember is that stories evolve and change both over time and across geography, and this keeps them fresh and meaningful. People are adapting and changing stories all the time. A good example of that is the figure of Thor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and in their comic books. There's been a lot of changes to who and what Thor is, and who's to say that this new version of Thor is any less true than the one we might have found in Iceland in the year 1000? It's interesting to me also that a lot of 
modern fantasy makes use of elements from the Norse mythology, such as elves and dwarves and so on, as well as the Greek mythology, such as centaurs, dryads, and satyrs. When it comes to looking at the psychological aspects of fairy, Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell are two of the foremost psychologists that have written about this topic. Carl Jung says that, quote, myths and fairy tales give expression to unconscious processes, and their retelling causes these processes to come alive and be recollected. So in a sense, they serve to join the conscious and subconscious mind. Joseph Campbell, who became very popular because of his various books and television series, is very interested in those underlying human truths, and especially in the hero's journey that are found in fairy tales and myth. Joseph Campbell says, quote, myth is much more important and true than history. History is just journalism, and you know how reliable that is. In Joseph Campbell, we also see an interesting example of that feedback loop that I was talking about previously. George Lucas, when he was working on Star Wars, intentionally crafted part of the original Star Wars movie to align with Joseph Campbell's Hero's Quest. And then later, after the movie was produced, Joseph Campbell ended up analyzing the movie and pointing out those mythic Hero's Quest elements that are found both in Star Wars and in other fairy stories and mythologies. With all these fantastic plot elements and strange situations, fairy stories can actually help us to learn and deal with the kinds of problems that we encounter every day, such as trust, honesty, stranger danger, about social classes or about society, racism, sexism, love, hate, mortality, power, and everything else human. By identifying with the characters in the fairy stories, we may be able to improve our own empathy. And of course, these stories do allow us to escape from our boring and mundane world and experience, if only for a little bit, that sense of wonder that fairy stories can bring. This is certainly a lot cheaper and healthier than using psychoactive drugs. And I like this quote here by Tolkien. He says, Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The point Tolkien here is trying to make is that there is no real problem with using fairy stories and fantasy literature to escape your day-to-day -day life. In fact, he would say that this is a good thing. And I think that we're especially ripe for the impact of these fairy tales when we're children and we're still figuring things out. But that being said, there's certainly a lot of layers of meaning that we can find when we go back and reread these stories as adults. It's interesting that the early fairy stories were usually set within the primary world. And although there was fairy, it was usually some place that you could get to. Perhaps like Avalon in the King Arthur stories, it was some place that you could sail to. A lot of early fairy stories also associated fairy land with the realm of the dead. So you would often enter fairy through a hill or a barrow. And usually in these stories, fairy would come to you. As C.S. Lewis put it, you would be met in the wide forest with some kind of magical creature like the fairy queen. Over time, of course, the location of fairy kind of changes. Technology, scientific learning, cartography push fairy off the map. There's no space left for it to exist. We know more or less where everything is. And when this happens, fairy becomes, by necessity, part of a secondary world and no longer reachable in our primary world through travel. You may have seen maps where when the cartographer didn't know what was in a particular place, when it had never been mapped or explored, that they would put the phrase, here be dragons. And it's really where the dragons are that fairy has a chance to live. Neil Gaiman put this best in his story Stardust, saying, We talk of the kings and queens of fairy as we would speak of the kings and queens of England. But fairy is bigger than England, as it is bigger than the whole world. For, since the dawn of time, each land that has been forced off the map by explorers and the brave going out and proving it wasn't there, has taken refuge in fairy. So it is now, by the time that we come to write of it, a most huge place indeed, containing every manner of landscape and terrain. Here, truly, there be dragons. Let's move on now to that taxonomy I was talking about. What we're trying to do here is classify the various types of fairy that we often see, with a particular emphasis on how you get there. The first category, which I call fake number one, is that the explanation for fairy is really advanced or alien technology, and as such, it doesn't really qualify as fairy. This relates to Arthur C. Clarke's third law that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we do see some examples of this, particularly in science fiction or horror literature. In H.P. Lovecraft's A Shadow Out of Time, an ancient race known as the Yith have the ability to swap bodies with other sentients through space and time. That's cool, but it's not really magic, and it's not really fairy. 
Another example of fake number one is Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern series. Now, Anne McCaffrey is a great writer, don't get me wrong, and the stories really read like fantasy, and she was the first woman to win a Hugo Award. But underlying this apparently fantastic idea of really cool leather-clad people riding dragons is the truth that this is really a science fiction story at heart. We learn that the dragons are nothing more than a native species on another planet that humanity has colonized, and over the years... They have bred these dragons to be larger and more friendly to humans until they reach the point where they can be ridden. So here again, from the perspective of this category, it's not really fairy, and it's not really magic. Now, McCaffrey didn't have to explain this world as being reached by spaceships. There's a perfectly legitimate and scientific way that we might have encountered these dragons. I'm speaking, of course, of a wormhole. Another example of technology masquerading as magic can be found in the Babylon 5 universe, where we have a group of people known as the Technomages. And these Technomages emulate magic through technology, sleight of hand, and psychology. But it's ultimately revealed in Jeannie Cavellos' trilogy of books that these powers come from an alien implant. So therefore, their magic doesn't count as the power of fairy, any more than hyperspace counts as a realm of fairy. My next category is what I would call the they were tripping category, or fake number two, in which the character was drugged or sleeping or the whole thing turned out to be a dream or a vision or possibly a coma or something like that. There are plenty of real life examples of drugs making people believe that magic was real. If you want to take a look at the Salem witch trials, it's a pretty good example. Or the oracle at Delphi who inhaled a lot of crazy gases and got visions. One book that matches this is Alice in Wonderland. And in Alice in Wonderland, it's all predicated on a dream as well as eating some dodgy cake and potions. But is it still fairy? It certainly seems like it. But if the whole thing turns out to be illusion, it doesn't fit. The next category, or fake number three, is the psychic powers explanation. And if the fictional world you're in can explain everything that a character does in terms of highly evolved human abilities rather than magic or something like that, then here again, it's not magic. It's not fairy. So a few good examples of this are in Frank Herbert's Dune, we have the Bene Gesserit witches who are able to do a lot of crazy things that seem magical, such as using the voice to compel people to do what they want. But the book explains this as no more than a highly evolved human capability. Another example is in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. We have a character called the Mule, and this character is able to manipulate the emotions of others, and it creates a lot of trouble for the protagonist of the story because he's able to adjust the trajectory of history. And, of course, we have perhaps one of the worst and most unnecessary explanations in movie history, the midichlorians of Star Wars. So how many midichlorians exactly did I need to be able to do a force choke? Moving on to categories that really are fairy, we have stuff such as type number one, which is fairy has always been around and it's been taken for granted. Usually this is fairy that exists in the primary world. And the real question is, why didn't we know this? Maybe we didn't believe hard enough or we never took the risk of climbing a magic beanpole, but for whatever reason, it's always been there and we just kind of hid from that knowledge. Classic fairy tales such as Cinderella really take it for granted that magic can happen in the real world, and also that pumpkins can make excellent transportation. And since fairy is always here, always has been here, there's even a good chance that you can leave it when you want to. They say that a wizard can be forced from fairy the same way a college student is forced from your university. They're expelled. The next category, or type number two, is that fairy has always been here, but it was well hidden. This fits magical school books such as J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson series, as well as Lev Grossman's The Magicians. A lot of these stories tend to have a gothic feel to them, and this category also fits really well with monster and monster hunting stories. So good examples for this category would include Bram Stoker's Dracula, Anne Rice's Interview with a Vampire, and a lot of the monster hunting type stories. In particular, on television, we had a couple of good ones, which was Supernatural and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'd also say that Jim Butcher's Dreadstone Files fits within this category. There's not just one wizard that's been able to pierce the veil and determine that magic is in fact real, as well as monsters. There's a whole society of wizards. And I have to imagine that when the White Council gets together, they call it a staff meeting. And presumably, they all live in a Magi nation. The next category, or type number three, explains fairy as being accessible through walls, gates, or liminal zones. So fairy may or may not exist physically in the primary world, but you can get there, usually through a door 
or some weak spot in reality. Examples of this include a couple texts from our Signum class, particularly Garth Nix's Sabriel and Neil Gaiman's Stardust. In both of these examples, you have to pass through a wall in order to get from one kind of reality to another. Another story going back a bit further is Lord Dunsany's The King of Elfland's Daughter, and in this case, there isn't a barrier per se, but the edge of fairy is clearly identifiable, even if it does move a little bit. On the one side, you have kind of the gray, dull, normal, mundane world, and on the other side, you have fairy, which is lit up and full of crazy colors and weird flowers and strange beasts, so you really know where you are pretty well. It's a common literary device, too, that what works on one side of the wall doesn't work in the other. So magic might work in fairy, but it won't work in the regular world. By the same token, most technology won't work in fairy. I was talking about this idea with one of my friends, and he told me that he just saw a TV show where a kid goes through a tear in a wall and ends up in a cold, dying dimension. I told him, stranger things have happened. Our next category, or type number four, is that you can get to fairy, but it requires travel. So, for example, you may need to sail west, or enter a cave, mound, or grave. You may need to get yourself good and lost in the forest. You may need to take a left at Albuquerque, or climb a beanstalk. This type is usually placed in the primary world, but it could be in a secondary world, or a tertiary world, someplace even more magical than the secondary world in which the main story is set. A few examples of this would be the island of Avalon in Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Morte to Arthur, or in Lud in the Mist, where the city of fairy is just up the river from where the protagonists live. Another one that is going back even further, and perhaps one of the best and earliest examples of the type, is Thomas the Rhymer from 1220. And in this story, he gets lost in the woods and ends up meeting the Queen of Fairy, who takes him on various adventures, and depending on the version that you listen to, he eventually makes it back after quite a long time and a trying experience. A category that's been especially popular in the last 50 years or so after we've learned more about scientific ideas such as quantum physics is the idea of the multiverse. And this is type number five, that fairy is in a parallel world that we can somehow get to. So in our story, characters can somehow shift dimensions using magic or technology or some innate ability. I think my favorite example of this in literature is Roger Zelazny's The Chronicles of Amber. And in the story, Corwin is able to walk between various universes or worlds and bring back not only weapons, but soldiers to help him in his fight. Another example of this is Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle, particularly if you look at the televised version that came out on HBO not too long ago. Isaac Asimov, Stephen King, and Philip Pullman also play with this idea quite a bit. I think that the fact that this category even exists shows that fairy tales are malleable and can change over time to adapt to the current circumstances of humanity. In some cases, our protagonist can't travel to fairy without a little bit of help. And here we have type number six, where a fairy is accessed through a portal or powerful object. The most famous example of this, of course, is C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, where the kids access a wardrobe or later painting to get access to fairy. Lev Grossman takes a similar approach in The Magicians in that his characters need to use something like a magic button or a magic key in order to move to their fairy realms. Robert Heinlein also plays with this in the book The Number of the Beast, which relies on a time machine in order to get access to those realms. There are certainly many other examples. If you don't have an innate ability to travel or a magic gizmo, then chances are that you're going to have to do some unusual thing in order to get access to the fairy realms. So, for example, perhaps you're going to perform a religious or cultic ritual, you're going to recite an incantation, read a forbidden book like the Necronomicon, maybe do some meditation or lucid dreaming, maybe you're researching spells or lost lore, or performing some strange procedure. Maybe you're making alchemical mistakes or waking up something that you shouldn't, in other words, poke in the Shagath. All of these are good examples of type number seven, which is unusual activities. I particularly like H.P. Lovecraft's idea that there's a crazy book called the Necronomicon and that if you read it, bad things will happen, such as going insane or possibly drawing the attention of otherworldly entities that you would rather not have know you exist. The Evil Dead movies and TV series also kind of build on this, and in this universe, it's enough to simply read the book. And if you do this, you'll soon be beset by hordes of demons trying to kill you. Jim Butcher's Harry Dresden could fit this category as well. He's always fiddling around with magic charms, making new shield bracelets and things like that, uh, researching, casting, complicated spells, and that kind of thing. 
But I think the one that I like the most is Charles Strauss's The Laundry Files series. And in Charles Strauss's universe, demons can be summoned by what would otherwise be very normal and innocuous behavior. Specifically, demons can be summoned accidentally if you happen to solve the wrong math problem or write the wrong computer program. So in this book series, they have a secret state organization that is responsible for going around and rescuing people who accidentally do this and start summoning demons and otherworldly entities through no fault of their own. Now, Strauss didn't have to limit himself to programmers and mathematicians. He could have picked other professions. For example, he could have used people that do a lot of complicated math while keeping the books. And these, of course, would be known as occultants. In some stories, accessing fairy harkens back to the old days when fairy was associated with the afterlife. And this is type number eight, fairy access through death. There are a lot of myths about underworld realms, such as Hades, that can be entered by the dead and the living. We have stories like Orpheus and Eurydice, or the anonymous Sir Orpheo, where a man goes into the underworld to bring back his lost wife. And Philip Pullman in his Dark Materials uses this idea when Lyra and Will enter the land of the dead. And a very popular example is Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. And here we see the author traveling through hell, purgatory, and paradise. In Nix's Sabriel, death is in fact a river with nine different sections to it that can be traversed in order to deal with the souls of the dead. My current favorite as Underworld Quest, though, is Anais Mitchell's Hadestown album, which is a great concept album that I strongly recommend. We talked previously about a situation where one might take drugs or something like that in order to get a false impression of fairy. But the converse is also true, and this is type number nine, fairy access through food, drinks, or drugs. In conventional fairy stories, it's kind of a standard that you don't drink the drinks and you don't eat the food while in fairyland or you might be stuck there forever. A lot of science fiction and fantasy authors make use of this idea. Lovecraft has several stories in which unnamed drugs allow the protagonist to access mysterious dreamlike realms where strange things happen. Charles Williams, one of the Inklings, has a story called War in Heaven, where there is a Satanist who takes a mysterious drug which gives him supernatural powers to do evil. And here again, we have Lud in the Mist, where magical fairy fruits caused the town people to go mad. They caused in the town's people madness, suicide, orgiastic dances, and wild doings under the moon, which normally wouldn't sound that bad. And, of course, we have the really obvious examples of Alice in Wonderland with the bottles that say, drink me, and the food that says, eat me, and pretty much every Philip Dick story, especially A Scanner Darkly. In some stories, getting to fairy wasn't the protagonist's idea. Rather, they were forced there by some external entity. And this is my type number 10, supernatural interference. Here we have characters that ended up in fairy, perhaps due to the meddling of gods, or demons and devils that were trying to get at his soul, or possibly kidnapped by fairies. Now, a lot of these explanations, when you look at them, kind of feel like sour grapes for normal things gone wrong. But it's always a good excuse. Have you been given a life of pain and suffering? It must have been the gods. Is your child suddenly autistic? They must have been stolen by the fairies and substituted with a changeling. Have you had an unexpected baby? Hey, that was probably Zeus who came to you in a beam of sunlight. For examples, see some Percy Jackson books or all of Greek mythology. I think it's interesting that in the Greek myths, even if the gods make you do something, like, for example, serve up your neighbor in a pie, you're still on the hook for the sin and can be punished. You just can't win. On a similar scale to the gods is type number 11, where fairy enters the world through some kind of massive or cataclysmic world event. In other words, things used to be normal until some crazy thing happened. One example of this that I really like is the role-playing game Shadowrun. And in Shadowrun, the world suddenly awakened during the 20th century to discover that magic begins to work. Humans slowly begin the process of goblinization, where a certain percentage of them start to mutate into elves, trolls, and dwarves. Dragons start appearing, and spell magic seems to work. Another example of this is Andrei Sapkowski's The Witcher series, and this is reflected both in the books and in the video game, where magic comes to Sapkowski's world through what he calls a conjunction of the spheres. In other words, there was another universe that collided with the normal mundane universe, and while it was connected, magic entered the world. Mysterious monsters moved over from this other universe, a little bit of magic leaked through, and when the spheres divided again, 
this was left over, and hence we have this kind of heritage of a little bit of magic left in the world. There's a few monsters, there's a few spellcasters, there's a few elves here and there, and a few dwarves, and yes, they're dwindling, but all of this can be explained through some kind of strange conjunction of the spheres. Last but not least, we have the well-populated category of general secondary worlds. In this type of secondary world, there's really no explanation for how we get there because we start there. Hence, it doesn't take spells or drugs or anything else. This is type number 12, where fairy exists in its own secondary realm. And we're usually dropped into this weird place where the characters take everything for granted, but we don't know what's going on. A good example of this is Ursula K. Le Guin's A Wizard of Earthsea, and in the story, we're introduced to a world that's full of seas and islands and wizards and magic for which we don't know the rules. We figure out a little bit of this, but ultimately, we never really know exactly what the rules of this world are. I think this category works pretty well for Peter Beagle's The Last Unicorn as well. And in this world, there are talking unicorns as well as real witches that run around with traveling menageries and things like harpies trapped in their cages. Certainly not something that you find in the primary world. But really, this category is full of stuff. Pretty much anything that you can think of that doesn't fit one of the previous categories is going to be here. So we have Terry Pratchett's Discworld, Tamara Pierce's Emelon, Middle Earth, Michael Moorcock's Multiverse, George R. Martin's Westeros, Piers Anthony Xanth, and on and on and on. Clearly, there's an almost limitless number of ways to describe and categorize fairy realms. One thing that I do think is really interesting is the way that scientific understanding relates to these stories. A lot of people, both within fiction and in regular life, seem to feel that technology and magic just don't mix. From a real-life point of view, though, this is a little bit silly, because I wouldn't have been able to do all of the research that I did for this video, let alone communicate it to you without the internet and computers. But let's take a minute to talk about technology within stories, because a lot of authors will fashion their world such that technology just doesn't work in the fairy realm, and this leads to some pretty silly situations. For example, in stories like Sabriel or Stardust, there is a border, and magic only works on the fairy side, while technology only works on the mundane side. Okay, so far so good. And I could see why magic wouldn't work in the mundane world, but why exactly is it that firearms don't work in fairy? Is it because the chemical reactions don't work there? If so, do campfires work the same in fairy, or do they look different? Is there a problem with springs not springing? Is it because of some rules of physics that are totally different in fairy? And if so, how? Why? Is it an alternate dimension? Is there some kind of all-powerful god of tech gremlins that watches carefully for chances to mess you up? These are the kinds of things that I think about. In summary, I'd like to say that it's really interesting watching the progressions of fairy tales over time, and I think you could see some interesting things happening from the earliest times where fairy was part of the primary world and just a hop, skip, and a jump away, to the newer versions where we have science and multiple dimensions and technology that gets us there. And I think that creating a taxonomy, however flawed, to analyze these different aspects of it can be a useful tool. Whatever the context of the fantastic, it has a lot of benefits for us in daily life. It allows us to imagine perspectives and situations that may never come up, and hopefully we can learn something about humanity while engaging our sense of wonder and imagination. Most importantly, though, fairy stories are just plain fun.